from the air, it is apocalyptic. On the ground, it is just desperately, desperately grim. Under the ground are girls, children and women, all of them buried underground. People are buried under this ground. You can smell the smell of death and the dead. There aren't enough body bags to contain infection. Fresh water and power are off. Roads will take who knows how long to be rebuilt. But astonishingly, for few expected survivors in this, noises below the rubble. Thank God we just found a family who were alive and we found some children who were dead. The people we rescued were there for three or four days. They said they hadn't even had a piece of bread. They were found by rescuers who heard sounds and our brothers from the West sent sniffer dogs. They had a big role. And what this army officer hints at is also remarkable. Help from our brothers in the West, rescue cooperation between Libya's rival administrations, because the causes of this disaster run deep. Following the Western-backed ousting of General Gaddafi and civil war, Libya has had two governments. Infrastructure has been left to rot and fingers are being pointed. This is the first of the dams that failed. There are claims neither had been maintained for years and competing accounts of whether an evacuation was or wasn't ordered. The broken remains of the second dam to collapse just outside the city. Tonight, inside Libya, there are demands for an inquiry to answer why it is now just rubble and a churned up riverbed. Imagine the weight of water it once retained. Multi-storey apartment blocks, barely a mile downstream, swept away by an unstoppable torrent. The force was devastating. The main highway crossing the wadi, no more. This is what Derna looked like the night before. But when it hit in the early hours of Monday morning, how many people lay asleep? Satellite comparison shows entire neighbourhoods simply erased from the map. Failing infrastructure, political feuds and huge amounts of rain dropped by Storm Daniel. Another grim hint of what climate breakdown may mean in human terms. Libya and other fragile states need help to cope with increasingly unpredictable storms. If there would have been a normally operating meteorological service, uh, they could have issued the warnings and, uh, and, and also the emergency management authorities would have been able to carry out evacuation of the of the people and we could have lost, uh, avoided most of the human, human casualties. Sadly, we know what happened next. There's a huge number of bodies in the sea, around 2,000. And because the weather's now good, we're still expecting to see more. But for many Libyans, this wait will never end. Untold, friends, family and neighbours may simply never be found. Well, before we came on air, I spoke to Dr Mohamed Abalefa, a doctor who's in the Libyan city of Benghazi. I asked him for the latest on the current situation on the ground. So far, the situation is still miserable and terrifying. A lot of people are trapped there, um, to the, especially in the areas near Darna, you know, the villages. Uh, a lot of people trapped on the roofs of the houses. A lot of people, the rescue teams, they cannot go to them because the roads um, were um, smashed. So uh, I think they're working on getting more uh, professional rescue teams um, to deliver the food and supplies to the trapped families, probably evacuate. And you're a medical doctor. Are you seeing anyone present with injuries um, from that region? Most of the injuries are, are really serious, especially fractures and brain, brain damaging, you know. Mm. And, and how worried are you now about disease because of the lack of clean water in many areas, but also, uh, to, be, to be blunt, the, the number of dead bodies in the streets? What we're afraid of... Um, at the meantime, uh, what comes after the, um, you know, the flood? Uh, dead bodies are in the streets. That the rescue teams are working on getting them out. So we're afraid of uh, um, spreading the pandemics. Like, for example, we've got cholera, we've got hepatitis A, we've got the typhoid fever. We're a bit afraid. So uh, the National Center of Diseases are actually sitting a plan at the meantime while I'm talking to you uh, to figure out how um, we can uh, provide such you know, protections and precautions before the 
these crises start to happen, you know. Mohamed Abelaitha, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Well, we're joined now from Istanbul by Anas El Gamati, founder of the Libyan independent think tank, the Sadek Institute. Uh, Mr. El Gamati, this clearly started as a natural disaster, an extreme amount of rainfall. But what role do you think that government and political failing played? Well, there was a critical reason for this. I mean, we can see the images that you've just shown earlier on. It doesn't look like the site of a flood. It looks like ground zero, literally. I mean, what happened was criminal negligence of the of the first order. The dam that had been overflowing with millions of cubic meters of water for several hours before they enforced a lockdown on the citizens of Derna at 7 p.m. on the 10th of September, that could have been avoided. They could have released the pressure valves. They could have at least done something technically to manage the flow of the water, and they failed to act. And mm -hmm. what happened next was that they unleashed a force of torrent of pressure of 100 terajoules or more, right? It ripped through the city, and that is the equivalent of at least the atomic bomb that hit Nagasaki. That's okay. for context, I mean, what happened it, to the city. It's clearly absolutely horrifying, and the, the facts about the maintenance of the dam and, and whether or not there was a lockdown, what citizens were told, there was some dispute around all of that, and I, I suppose we might at some point get to the answer. But the broader point, I suppose, is that there are two governments, parallel governments, vying for power, and that broken politics has allowed this to happen. It certainly has. The country has been desperate for elections now for a decade. The Libyan parliament has suffocated those elections, gripping onto power for the last nine years. It's, it's testimony to the way in which we talk about democracy in this part of the world. Both of those rival administrations are unelected. They've both been appointed, one by an expired parliament and one by the UN neither of which is in their DNA to cooperate. They're both there to compete with one another. And right now they have to coordinate something that will try to remove the suffering, which is really a race against time now for those that are remaining in the city. As you've already mentioned and, and your guest mentioned, there is uh, the, the risk of disease spreading amongst the 40,000 that are displaced, mm. the 25,000 that we think that are dead, and maybe 10,000 that we think that are missing. Yeah. Those 10,000 still have a chance. Those 40,000 have a chance. But they have to coordinate amongst a fractured system that is not designed to allow the smooth ease of movement of aid from the west of the country through to the east. It's neither going to allow this authoritarian system, the Libyan National Army that is in control of the uh, ports and the city of Derna itself, is not there and it's not designed to allow the governor and the governed to have a smooth conversation. Well, and That's that, what led to the And that place. fracturing um, that you've described so clearly, what role do you think foreign powers have played in that breakdown of Libyan politics over so many years? They've propped up the Libyan National Army. They have been propping up the rival factions themselves now for several years. We know that the, uh, the, the, the some of the main uh, countries that are involved in this, the United Arab Emirates, was bombing Derna in 2015 and 2017 alongside Egypt. Today they're sending uh, aid, thankfully, but their hands are on this and they're, and they're propped up. Khalifa Haftar is an authoritarian tin pot system for the last several years. And this is why it's so important, because in a true democracy, it's not about uh, you know authority alone. The, the authorities are a, a guardian of public trust. And if you can't trust those that have the authority, then mm. what do you do? That's the reason why this is no longer a luxury. It's a necessity for the people of Libya. It's not about representation. It's about having accountable and responsible government in place to be able to handle not only the, the, the days that we're leading up to this, but now the coordination and the future, because that city has to rebuild, yeah. the country has to heal, and it can't do that unless it starts to move forward with fresh leadership. Anas Hogamati, thank you very much for joining us tonight.